Hi, Daniel. Hello. Oh, hi. Brian's on the phone. Hello, Brian. Oh, I just I just called you 15 minutes ago. Good morning. Hey, Barbara. Good morning. Oh, Jen. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you can't see me. There we go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Daniel has left the beach. What was that? Daniel has left the beach. He was just there on the phone and then he was gone. I think it's funny. It reminds me of Harry Potter movies. You've ever seen where people come in and out of their painted painted portraits? Oh, <laughs> I saw the I saw the first movie, but not any of the others. Your um, audio is a little bit muffled. Ooh, okay. I don't know what I can do about that. Good morning, Anjanette. Good morning, Bruce. Is it still muffled? I'm trying to speak louder. Just a touch, but not much. Hmm. Let me see. I can hardly notice, Jen, but I think I hear just a tiny bit. I think you're probably fine if you can't figure it out. Okay. Thank you. And good morning, Tony. And Brian. Good morning, everyone. Does that sound any different? Um, sounds the same, but it's better than it was when you first got on. Okay. So Barbara, it sounds fine to me. Uh, so I'm wondering if it's somewhere on your system. Uh, I don't know. I've never had that on my system before. Um, I don't know. Well, I put my volume all the way up, so hopefully that'll help. Morning, Megan. Good morning, Greg. Good morning. Hey, while we're waiting, uh, did anyone else uh, see Vivek's presentation for Portland Audubon? That was pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool presentation. Yes, it was. And Daniel, one thing I was going to do, but I think anyone that went got it, is I was going to send the recording to Brian to share with everyone because the recording's available for folks that couldn't make it. Would, yeah. Um, 
Megan, would you please? I meant to listen in on that, and I must have just lost track of time. Yeah, I, I Vivek really... sent me a, a link to it because it's yeah, you know pretty I big file. Too. It's a big file. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, Brian, if you just want to send it around to everyone, that would be great. Yep. Sure thing. Hey, yeah. Brian, I knew you. I knew you looked so familiar to me, and I was just like, I recognize that background. It's like because you're on the pack. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> I, I was just like wait a That's minute something, some, something yeah, well, why is why why is he here too <laughs> no it's great now i've just made the connection i love it that's funny yeah <laughs> so what is the pack is that a staged background you can put on your computer uh, the pack is the city's uh pedestrian pedestrian advisory group so. and now the the street tree thing it all just it makes so much sense you know it's all clicking together for me Hmm. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm running a little bit late today. I went on to this as a participant, as an attendee, and then realized that was a different link than I need to be on. Oh. <laughs> I tried raising my hand, Brian, but <laughs> raising hand <laughs> without a microphone. But um, good to see you all. Hello. Hello. Right. Um, do we have quorum? One, two, three, four, five, six, six. I think we are just at quorum, if I understand. Yeah, I think you're right. We're good. Okay. Well, well seven with you. Ah, seven with me. Correct. Yeah. Ah, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Okay, well, I will go ahead and get us started, get the little pieces in place here with our agenda, multiple screens moving at once. All right, let's call the meeting to order. Um, welcome everybody. Um, March 18th, 2021, we are, uh, the sun is moving rapidly north at this point and we're, um, about to see spring spring. Um, I imagine you're already seeing little signs of it all around your neighborhoods, which is um, part of the year where I think my heart suddenly starts to go flutter. And it's kind of a neat time to, uh, even though we have a cloudy day here in Portland, it's, it's a time where I think all the plants are starting to get more and more um, respiration. Um, the air is definitely scented with uh, something totally uh, fresh. I um, hope, you're, hope you're getting a chance to get outside a little bit, enjoying the spring as it's coming up. Um, we have a pretty full agenda today. Um, we have, in essence, uh, the, two big, the two big things is we have um, the Title 11 fund report, and then we have a discussion of the, about the bylaws, and that has to do with committees and, um, yeah, bylaws in general. Um, and I, we're going to start with the urban... Actually, before we do that, though, we're going to start with public comments and then the Urban Foresters Report. I want to talk a little bit about onboarding as well in a minute. So hopefully you've gotten a chance to look at the agenda and um, ready to go. Am I missing anything? Is that, does that sound accurate? Um, public comments? Yeah. So that's, that's first. Oh. Right. All right. Good. Let's go ahead and get started then. Um, Brian, do we have any public comments signed up? I don't see anyone, no one who's attending has their hand raised. So um, looks like we don't have any. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and get started then um, uh, with the Forster's report. Jen, do you wanna get us started? Certainly, thanks Vivek and good morning again, everyone. And as Vivek said, yes, spring has sprung. Happy spring. I have six items for you this morning and I'll try to get through them all and then have some time for any questions and clarifications. So the first is a follow-up 
on development on Southeast 82nd between Stark and Washington Avenues that Doug Klotz asked about in public comments last month at last month's meeting. And the follow up on that, since I said I would go and look into it, is that there were errors in the permitting process by the Bureau of Transportation and Urban Forestry that resulted in trees not being planted on the 82nd Avenue frontage in particular. Uh, there are trees on the other ones. However, trees are required there. That's been communicated and the correction is to be made within 180 days. Move on to the second item. Um, I was asked, uh, some folks were interested in a, an update on the tree planting program realignment project with BES. And that update is that BES has indicated that due to recent BES Bureau reorganization and management hiring needs, they're unable to focus on the tree planting program realignment at this time. The current permit under which BES plants street trees expires in May and no new, no new, excuse me, no new permit is planned. Uh, Portland Parks and Recreation will reach out again this summer to ascertain if BES has interest in pursuing an intergovernmental agreement with parks to expand parks tree planting efforts next year on BES's behalf. The third item, Streets 2035, that was the presentation last month, which Matt Burko and Michelle Marks from Bureau of Transportation gave for you all in that discussion you had. Um, so that I've been updating monthly on that. So there's not much of an update this month since you had that presentation and discussion last month. Um, I did note that Water Bureau's requirement of not planting trees within 10 feet of a larger transmission pipe wasn't discussed. Um, and just as a reminder on that and an update, um, recall that this is a relatively new practice being implemented unilaterally by the Water Bureau, which would eliminate thousands of currently occupied and future street tree spaces. Uh, there are already at present many large mature street trees currently within 10 feet of transition, transmission pipes in complete streets with no issues for the transmission pipes having been observed or documented. And urban forestry has uh, communicated this fact and addressed all the perceived issues that have been raised by Portland Water Bureau. Um, in addition to the Streets 2035 project, having committed to address this particular topic, uh, Water Bureau is drafting an administrative rule which includes this requirement. The proposed administrative rule should come to the Urban Forestry Commission as well as Urban Forestry for review and comment um, according to the expectations of city policy processes. Um, and conversations with the Water Bureau staff about the role of the or Urban Forestry Commission advising the city on policies affecting the urban forest means that uh, that draft administrative rule, when it's to that point, they're still working on it, would come back to the Forestry Commission for comment to in some form. I'm going to move on to my fourth item. I have been updating pretty regularly on the street tree maintenance policy and funding project. There's really nothing new to tell you there. The plan is to be completed. However, it's been delayed due to new work priorities having been added, primarily the Title 11 amendments. And recall that working for this particular policy change is not planned as part of the operations levy because doing so was not supported by Portland voters in the levy polling. However, we plan to look for other opportunities, including through the Parks Sustainable Future Project. Fifth item. Uh, the two proposed new Urban Forestry Commissioner appointments are now being reviewed by Commissioner Rubio's office, and we hope to see appointments by council in the next month or so. So hopefully new commissioners joining you all soon. And I know Vivek wants to talk about onboarding. And the last item, um, so with the parks levy, Portland Parks and Recreation and Urban Forestry have a lot of employment opportunities coming up, and folks can sign up with the city's human resources department to receive routine notices of job openings. I'm gonna put a link in the chat for that in a minute. So you all can have that. Also in Tree Bark, the bi-monthly newsletter that Urban Forestry puts out, we always post active openings as they become active. And in Urban Forestry, there will be new opportunities in all of our work units. That's the operations work unit, science policy and planting, permitting and regulation, and the city forester's office. 
And those positions will be in the city classifications of supervisor, coordinator, analyst, arborist, GIS technician, uh, tree techs, which are development services technicians in their class, city classification, botanic specialist, uh, business system analyst, and tree inspector. So it would be great, commissioners, if you could spread the word on these opportunities that are coming up. It's good work and a good team. And we're looking for folks who can diversify and otherwise improve our team and the services we provide, and including, of course, stewarding and growing Portland's forest, supporting communities in doing that, and improving urban forestry's program services for all Portlanders. So I'll put that in the chat right now. And that was my last item. So if anyone has any questions for clarification, please ask. I see Bruce. Bruce's hand. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Thank you, Vivex. Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, Jen, the uh, uh, comment about BES uh, and their, I don't know, discontinuation sounds like, does that mean they're not going to uh, be supporting uh, tree planting or tree pruning in the right of way strip for the next year? Uh, they are working, Bruce, right now on continuing to work on reorganizing BES and figuring out where all of their services fit together. Um, so that's, that's something that they're working through. Uh, any specifics on that? Of course, as you know, uh, planting, pruning, or other things involving street trees do require urban forestry permits. So does that mean um, there has been no permit issued to BES for any activities after, I don't know, April or so? So as I said, uh, the current permit expires at the end of May and there isn't a plan for another permit after that because they're working through a reorganization. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Greg and then Matt. Oh, yeah, Matt, Matt, you're guest in the conversation. So I want to come, I want to call in a commissioner first and then come back to you if that's okay. Of course. Greg? Yeah, my question is uh, during the realignment, was there any discussion? Do we? actually know how much uh, BES was investing each year. They didn't, you know, ever seem to not um, see a reason not to make that investment. It was more where it should be done and, and who, how, how the bureaus would collaborate or just, you know, one bureau do the work. Did you repeat your question, Greg? Do, do you know uh, how much uh, BES had, had um, budgeted for this program in the past? Um, I do not recall a specific number. Brian, do you happen to know what was reported? The numbers that I've heard from them are were the value of the contracts, um, which included, you know, there's, I think there were three total contracts and I want to say the total was around 1.5 million um, their total investment would have been larger because that doesn't include staff and other expenses um, to you know manage the program on the BES side but um, the 1.5 million is the number I often heard them heard them use that help Greg yeah I mean it's scary to me to think of uh, how many trees that was getting planted and that it might uh, disappear even for a year. So one thing about that, right, is they have not, BS is not saying that they're not continuing to invest in trees. They're saying they're reviewing as they're reorganizing BES what their plans will be, right? Okay. <clears throat> Matt and then Megan. Thanks. Um, so, um, Everyone, thanks again for um, allowing me to, to sit in on the meeting. This is Matt Klazuski from, Matt Klazuski from Commissioner Mapp's office. Um, the budget number, to answer your question, uh, Greg, was 1.3 million, and that does not include the um, uh, staff time, as Brian had alluded to. Um, so my first question um, to uh, Forrester Cairo, um, why, why was the BES permit not extended to the end of the calendar year? Um, because it seems like it's been getting administratively extended month after month 
Um, and now you have, um, you're saying that it's the end of May, but um, why, why was it not extended? Why was the decision made to not extend it to the end of the calendar year, which is what BES requested? Uh, so Matt, I'm not aware of BES having requested that. The Bureau directors have been working on this and I'm not, you know, that would be a good question, I think, for the Bureau directors that you, you might want to ask. But meantime, regarding the programmatic permits, they follow the planting per permit, or I'm sorry, the planting season. So the planting season is the winter. So all of the programmatic permits that involve planting and all of the previous BES permits have run in that, in that time frame. Um, and uh, it'd be difficult to have one that runs through half of a planting season. Planting a tree, especially in streets where there are more considerations than in other places is generally at least a year long process from identifying locations, doing things we call locates to make sure there's not infrastructure conflicts, as well as uh, procuring the right species of trees uh, at the right sizes to go in the specific locations. So it's, a, it's not as simple as it might look and that's why that time frame is typically longer. No, I appreciate that, thank you. Um, uh, I've, uh, I used to actually, uh, I was trying to build a tree planting program when I was at Clackamas County. So this is something that I spent a lot of time on. Um, so, but yeah, so the, I guess my question is still about the, the why it was extended month by month. It was expired at the end of January, then it was extended to the end of February. What, why would, do you know why it was so piecemeal? And then we just arrived at this end of the fiscal year um, date. Yeah, so the, it was done month by month because BES and Portland Parks and Recreation have been continuing to work on the interagency idea of transferring the program uh, into parks. And that was a result of last summer's stakeholder process or a continuation of that advice was received from the stakeholder group with consultants uh, assistance and Vivek was involved in that himself over the summer. And the two bureaus have been exploring how to pursue uh, the feedback received and the, and the proposal that was on the table at the time, which was to realign the BES program over into parks directly. Um, and the, the way, because that work was happening, it wasn't expected that the permit would necessarily need to continue. So as that work continued, uh, the permit was extended. And then the bureau directors determined uh, that the program uh, wouldn't be renewing the permit because BES, as I said earlier, needs the opportunity to look at how they're reorganizing their, their entire bureau. Um, and so it was extended through the end of the year because they've made clear that they're not gonna be working on this over the next few months. And they hope to pick up that work later. Thank, I thank that, you. I hope that helps. Um, um, so hypothetically speaking, if BES came to parks and said, um, as part of our realignment, we actually would like to keep the existing program that we have um, as, it, as it exists, separate from parks, you know, the 1.3 million, the small street tree program, uh, would you issue a permit to allow that to continue since that's been the state of affairs for a, a long period of time? Right. Good question, Matt. And there have been two processes. I uh, mentioned the one this past summer. There was also one I, I mentioned in a way, but I'll explain because I'm. you may not know about this. That was, uh, I think it was two winters ago. Yeah, um, that Parks and BES undertook directly at the direction of Commissioner Fish to look for opportunities for good governance, governance and more effective outcomes in streamlining work. And an outcome of that was the Bureau Director uh, Jordan um, thinking that the program should move into urban forestry. Then the second stakeholder process was this past summer, as I mentioned, with stake external stakeholder groups. Um, and the, what the, those processes found was the programmatic permit is not the right vehicle for the BES investment in tree planting. There's a, a lot of issues around that that were discussed through both groups. And that's why what's, what has been discussed is an interagency agreement instead uh, that would bring those BES resources and that investment directly into parks and parks would then basically plant trees on behalf of BES. So that's the way that is planned to go forward if and when 
uh, that proceeds. And again, that's what BES has to work on in their reorganization and in hiring. So, so what I'm hearing is that if they wanted to keep it the way it was, you would not be inclined to allow it to continue because of these, um, this, this uh, previous process under Commissioner Fish in that direction. That's your justification, right? It started under Commissioner Fish and has continued because the last summer was under the current commissioners for the, the two bureaus. Um, and uh, the and it's it's the bureau director's intention to come up with a different arrangement uh, depending on what BES determines in their reorganization. They just they have indicated that they don't have the capacity right now to really work on how that might go. Um, so that's why there's there's a bit of a hold on it and why the current permit was just extended through the end of the planting season. Okay, thank you. Um, so my other question is about the water bureau. Um, so you were mentioning about their administrative role. Um, and can you remind me uh, of what was the, the, the distance that you um, had cited from large foreign trees from the uh, water mains? What was the distance? So Bureau of Water Supply, or Portland Water Bureau rather, has, has put a, a requirement in effect that no trees may be planted within 10 feet of a transmission line. That's what they call those. Uh, those transmission lines are 24 inches or greater in diameter. Okay, thank you. Um, so have you had conversations with the Water Bureau about what might be a compromise sort of location? Um, I know that other, other cities around the country, um, including many here in the Pacific Northwest, do actually have similar requirements for infrastructure protection. Um, but some 10 does, 10 does seem like a larger number than I, I perhaps have read about some others. I know that Seattle has a minimum of five feet from the edge of the water main to the edge of the tree, um, is is there any potential uh, you know conversation about uh, you know compromise or negotiation on this topic from your perspective? We've been in discussion, Matt, with Water Bureau for over five years on this at all levels, um, and what was in place previously was a five foot requirement, and they changed that to ten. Um, and those conversations continue, as I mentioned, that has been. Uh, housed most recently in the Streets 2035 project. So at the request of commissioners, the Water Bureau committed early in that project to make sure this, this particular issue was a component of it. And also uh, other parts of the Bureau are, are working on it, bureaus are working on it as well. All right, we're running low on okay, time Okay, thank here. you. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I'm, I'm all That's, done. I'm all done. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks for the insights and questions. Um, Daniel, I know you wanted to say something about tree planting as well. Um, or was it more general? Yeah, well, I actually had a, a comment, but I did want to mention something also uh, Brian and I had talked about. I guess just I'd like to throw out as a suggestion on this um, issue we've been talking about several times over the last year, you know, about the two different bureaus and the tree planting. It occurs to me that regardless of what happens, both bureaus will still be involved a lot in planting trees. Um, there are various other programs other than this street tree program, you know, like parks has the uh, urban forestry has the yard tree program and uh, BES has their reveg program on, on the tree, on the properties that they manage. And it seems that they're it, it might be good to have a, a discussion with the two bureaus at some point about just kind of the bigger picture about where trees are going in across the city because there um, there's so many different efforts going on and I think it would be good to just look at that big picture where where we need trees where the city could be planting trees because it's not just street trees and it's not just yard trees it's not just city owned properties there are a lot of different things I mean just as an example a few years ago. Um, at Johnson Creek Watershed Council, we, we had a similar discussion with the Reveg team at BES, and we came up with this huge swath of area in Portland that needs some trees, um, and that's the homeowners association properties that's jointly owned, but there really are no homeowners associations, and so we ended up working with them, and they, they gave us some funding to, to try to engage homeowners associations, but that's just like one little piece, and I think there are probably some other holes and I think it would be good to have a have a discussion at that point about 
strategically where are some of these other holes where we really could use some trees. Sounds great, Daniel. Strategic tree planting, you know, we have the tree planting strategy, which accounts for some of those things. So sort of following right. up on that would be great. And, and so everyone is aware, just to remind you that any of the tree planting that's happening on BES properties or other reveg properties that are city owned, that's also under urban forestry's permits. And there are different permits for different programs like that because right. they're very different planting techniques. Right. Know. And like to just segue to my, my last comment here, which is I, I want to give a shout out to Urban Forestry's Yard Tree Program. Um, we at the Watershed Council, we had this project where we're doing a big stormwater retrofit project at a low income senior housing complex, and we needed some trees, some bigger trees to plant to help with stormwater issues. And um, we contacted Molly Wilson at the Urban Forestry Department. And we said, if you have some leftover yard trees from last year's, we can take them. And so they donated 15 uh, trees in five gallon containers. We got them in last week with our uh, NCCC AmeriCorps crew. So I just wanted to say thank you. That was great uh, getting those trees. And um, at the ends of the year with the yard tree giveaways in the future, we could probably get them in the ground for you if you need to. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Oh, that's great news. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And I'm, um, thanks, Daniel. And I'm noting Megan's note about seconding Daniel's proposal um, and wanting to get some more dedicated time to this conversation. Um, I will note that you know we we've, we've been trying to work with PGE to they did a big um, assessment of um, the region with a plane that flew overhead and got a lot of data. And we are looking at the 2014 and 2019, but there's some issues with the pro processing of those data. So we were supposed to have had those data and have finished it by now, but it didn't. Um, in my day job, the university, we, we haven't been able to get reliable data from PGE yet because of some issues with the original processing of the data. So not by PGE, but by the contractor quantum spatial. And part of what we could do in the meantime is um, look at is to support any uh, help that you have with urban in urban forestry about tree planting locations. Like I have folks who could actually help with that if 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 it doesn't fit into staff um, at least time frame. If there are locations of where trees are planted or anything like that, we could help bundle together what BES is planted at least through their contract with Friends of Trees, and then. Uh, we actually did that for the last 30 years of BES uh, Friends of Trees contract plantings that have happened around the uh, city. We have that data geocoded and located with genus uh, at genus level as well as uh, percentages of different um, different um, species and genus of trees. And so, I'm happy to contribute to that conversation if helpful. I'd love to see that kind of comprehensive distribution of where the trees are going over time, even you know every five year increments, we were able to break it down into at least with the Friends of Trees data that we were able to look at. And that's part of a different Robert Wood Johnson project that we're working on. But I would love to like assemble that and support any of that if, if, so, if you're so willing. We have capacity right now and it'd be a great, great springtime project. Great, Thank, thanks Vivek. If I could just follow up on that. Um, this is something that we're working on in urban forestry. Oh, Since we're the, the leaders for the forest management and that's our assigned right. role, how do we capture all the different planting activities within the city in different places and be aware of that, have that accurately reported so we know what's going on with it, um, including monitoring, because uh, a tree planted may be nothing in the next few years. It has to be maintained and succeed to become part of the overall services we need from trees. Um, and, and yeah, and how's that become part of reporting for the city as well as strategic planning? Where are we seeing gaps like uh, what was it that you said, Daniel, or somebody said about um, private properties, churches, and things like that that may have opportunities, or schools? That's an area we've looked at a lot. So thanks for that. We're all on the same page there. Great. Yeah, and the one just final comment that I want to make is every time this comes up, we never have the dedicated time to talk about it. And I know that because of various things, we kind of keep it keeps emerging that there's a lot of interest around this. And clearly, I think we're all um, 
we all sit on this commission because we really care about these issues. So I think, um, and I know that some of us have requested this. So I think setting aside the time so we can have the conversation rather than feeling we're trying to fit the conversation into a time constrained space and having the people that we can ask the questions to that are engaged, I think would be really helpful. I appreciate the report outs, but I clearly think that this is something that continues to emerge. So why don't we just set aside the time needed to have the conversation conversation so that we're all up to speed. Yep. Thanks, Megan. Yeah. And, and we do, we, Megan, we are on a, a cycle, like an annual cycle with a planting update. And we're trying to get into that. So that would be an appropriate place for that to be. Great. Um, excellent. Thanks, all. Um, I, I, thanks for that report, Jen. Clearly a lot, a lot of fervor there um, for interest in digging into the BES question, as well as the kind of uh, strate strategy or a, a strategery question, <laughs> I guess it might be. Um, so I'd like to just spend a few minutes transitioning here. So let's come back to that. I've chalked down a couple of, or, or uh, put down a couple of um, notes to come back to um, on that, on those topics. Um, I'll follow up with Brian and Jen for upcoming meetings to see how we can schedule time to get into this a bit more. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit transitioning about onboarding. As you heard from Jen in the report, the, um, we, have two, we have two people who are going to, who are excited about joining uh, the commission, who I'm delighted to have met as well and um, really looking forward to their contributions. And given that we used to meet in, you know, in City Hall and have conversations informally and kind of even go grab uh, food and be able to chit chat a little bit. This is kind of an awkward time to be, you know, uh, whether it be hiring somebody in a, in a job or hire, getting somebody on board to a commission like this. I wanted to just open a little bit of space for a conversation about like, how can, how can we bring folks on to the commission and not just say, okay, just catch up. Here we go, everybody. We're just going to start in on the agenda and um, is there anything that comes to mind in terms of how we could onboard the two new commissioners so that they are both uh, informed about the things we've talked about? And I'm happy to do the groundwork in terms of meeting with them, talking about the issues that we've been coming up. I'd love some company on that too. Um, though, if there are any other ideas that come to mind for how we could make this a seamless or at least not so bumpy transition from being somebody who's been really um, interested in you know, civic life and participating in uh, commission to somebody who might be an active contributor to the commission um, in a in a easy way. So I want to just make some space here for the next about five to seven minutes for uh, ideas that might come up, and I'll certainly jot those down. Yeah, let's start Daniel, and then Bruce, and then Barbara. Yeah, just want to throw out on my board of directors when we have new directors to onboard, we assign um, somebody who has been on the board for a long time as a mentor. Oh, okay. So I think um, doing that mentorship and, you know, at least for the first couple months, just plan on offline the mentor and the new board member having a new commissioner having a, just a, a chat one on one and answer questions. And that's worked really well to help bring people up to speed. Oh, good. About how long do those last, Daniel? Do they last like six months, a year just to get folks on or how how do you structure it? Um, well, we just assign a mentor and then the two people just decide okay among themselves you know how often to meet or and, and a lot of times it's just a resource you can go to if you have questions and you don't want to ask at the the big meetings okay yeah oh thank you bruce um oops sorry yeah okay. i wondered um it's possible people will, are going to be vaccinated. I don't know where we're at in terms of that, but I, I think there is going to be a day sooner than later, mm -hmm. I hope by the summer, where we're all vaccinated. So I, I would encourage some face-to-face, -face, God, maybe even non-masked saying hello. Yeah, we'll, we'll see about that. Maybe we could meet in a park or something like that, at least to begin with. Um, thanks, Bruce. Um, Barbara, uh, you're muted. Oop, you got rid of your video. Okay. 
get your audio back on. No. Oh. Give you another second here. Come back to you, maybe. Okay, Megan, you want to take a while well, Barbara gets that fixed. Yeah, it, you know, you think a year in and we still all are figuring it out. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, my quick and Barbara, feel free to once unmuted, just stay unmuted while I finish. Um, I just think that if there's any of us also, and you can certainly reach out or we can offer, but to do coffee or virtual coffee or tea or I don't know, whatever, a meeting, get together. I think it's also nice to create opportunities to just get to know the person offline and talk about their interest. And so I think um, anyone that's interested and willing to offer that, I think it's really meaningful and helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I would encourage any and all of you to reach out for sure and see if there's, I mean, getting multiple perspectives from commissioners about their experience on the commission, things that are really sparking their interest, things that they're finding to be really, um, need opportunities or potentially even challenges to have that frank conversation about the commission, I think would be really worthwhile. So yeah, I, great, Megan, like informally chatting with coffee or tea or, yeah. Anything else coming up, Barbara? Looks like you're unmuted. Yeah, um, when I started on the commission, which was uh, 2013 or 2014 or some dark ages date like that, um, I was given a two inch book full of the urban forestry management plan and lots of other things. Um, and uh, I started into it and started reading it and, and all that. And it was completely overwhelming. And it didn't give me a very strong sense. I mean, I, I got a lot of policy stuff, but I didn't get a very strong sense of the commission and how it operated. And one of the things that I think uh, has a lot of value is, um, as someone suggested, kind of sitting down, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or small groups or parks or coffee shops or, you know, whatever it is. And I think masking is a personal choice. If people want to wear masks, I think that's, that's their uh, choice. But anyway, um, I think that has a lot of value. I also think that coming to a meeting and maybe sitting in on some, some Zoom calls prior to that, you know, if we ever have a meeting again, but sitting in on Zoom calls, I think gives a, a good sense of how the commission works and you know the, the processes and the, the issues and all that. And I know that Bruce did that. Um, you know, he's he's been uh, around quite a bit. And I, I just think that there's you get a better sense of the commission and the issues and the operating style and all that if you're you know, listening in or, you know, talking with people. Okay, great, thank you. Um, is, there any is there any chance of that, Brian? Do you know um, one way or another to potentially invite them to join? Uh, if they're gonna wait for Rubio's office to confirm and it's gonna take another month after that or maybe even a month late, would it be possible to have them join in April just even if they're sitting in? Yeah, absolutely, we can, we can definitely, invite them to um we're obviously just we're just not sharing the names right now just because it's yeah. not 100 percent. but um yeah absolutely i think the, the the hope right now is that they would that that may would be their first official meeting but definitely if it looks like this thing is moving forward and the confirmations are going to be there um absolutely great yeah they i mean they can join as members of the public uh yeah. at this point so yeah there's yes. um it, you know and as an in progress knowing that we don't have the final say so right mm -hmm. and th they both have um attended past past meetings as they were going through the process to learn more about the commission y'all just didn't know that <laughs> a little uh, uh hanging out kind of uh in the background uh creepy um <laughs> if swords but um great thanks anything else before we close this out i really appreciate this feedback um i'd like to just yeah it's about longevity i mean barbara was saying how long she's been on the commission it's like that's actually a success story in many ways holding on being contributing being participating i think it's just fantastic that we have that kind of longevity on the commission it adds to the institutional memory and of course adds to the momentum that we can remember mistakes that we've made in the past as well as 
opportunities that have emerged and how we've been able to make a, a contribution. So yeah, great, uh, thank you. I wanna turn it over. Uh, Barbara, did you wanna say anything else? I, I wanna close it out here, okay. Well, that's good, thanks. Great. Um, well, to, I'd like to transition. We have a, a Title XI fund report that uh, we uh, have the privilege of having Angie DeSalvo join us uh, today. And Angie, nice to see you. It's been a long time. Hope you're- I know. Well. Um, I'd like to just turn uh, the floor over to you. And if you would just let, um, if you would introduce yourself again to us as I, we know you're a science outreach and uh, planting manager and um, yeah. And, and the purpose of this Title 11 fund report and background and all that good stuff, if you could get into, that'd be fantastic. And we've set aside uh, until about 1045 Portland time. Okay, sounds great. Thanks, Yvek. Everyone, it's great to see all of you. It feels like it's been a really long time. Uh, my name is Angie DeSalvo, and I'm a manager at Urban Forestry with our science outreach and tree planting programs. And I am going to talk today about our Title 11 Trust Funds financial report. So we're going to talk a lot about um, expenses, expenditures, and revenues, uh, and obviously a lot around tree planting. But before we jump into that, I thought I would I would take a minute, Jen, if it's okay. I have a new staff member uh, who's listening in as well, Mari Avalos, and I'd love to have her introduce herself um, since a lot of what we're talking about is going to be her future work. Yeah, Mari, do, would you like to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Mari and I just started with um, the SOP team on in November. Um, I moved here from Indianapolis, um, so it was quite an adventure, um, but Portland has been great so far. I'm really enjoying the job. Um, a lot of my responsibilities are very similar to what I did in my previous job, um, where I managed um, plantings throughout Indianapolis um, at about like 3,000 trees per year, um, working for a nonprofit that um, worked with city contracts and our own water bureau out there to help plant trees for stormwater mitigation as well. Um, and I will say that the biggest difference is that all of the work that I did there was very vo volunteer based, um, whereas here I'm working with contractors to, um, to get the trees planted. And so it's been great. Um, this season we've planted a little under 250 trees. Um, and so I'm excited to wrap it up and get going on the next round. So thank you for having me. Awesome, thanks, Mari. Great, so all of you received a copy of our Title 11 Trust Funds report. Brian, if you wouldn't mind pasting it in the chat for folks to have if you don't have access to it. I'm not gonna show a PowerPoint, I just figured I'd, I'd walk you through it and we can have a conversation about the report. Um, so as background, um, created in 2015, Title 11 trees, our city's tree code, established two trust funds and each year, Urban Forestry brings a summary, summary report of all the revenue and expenditures um, to both Urban Forestry Commission as well as City Council so that you can see what, what's come in and what's gone out of the fund. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And I will go fund by fund, I'll cover highlights and then we'll have opportunity for questions. I'm guessing based on what we were just chatting about is that there are gonna be a lot of questions around tree planting and I'd love to come back at a future date to talk more specifically about what we've been doing and the work uh, that urban forestry is doing. Uh, but I'm going to try and keep it brief and, and focused on financials. Okay, so something to remember that this is a fiscal year report. So the reporting period is from July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. So think of that as the year of before COVID to the year of early COVID. <laughs> That's the time period that I'm reporting on. So if you wanna follow along, I'm gonna start on page five and there are two different trust funds, the Tree Planting and Preservation Fund, which I'll cover first and the Urban Forestry Fund. So the Tree Planting and Preservation Fund enables the city forester to mitigate for lost canopy. And that's generally from unmet tree preservation or planting standards. So fund contributions come from a couple of different places. So during development, payment can be made in lieu of preservation or planting. 
um, when you can't meet requirements. And most of the revenue comes from that source. Um, secondly, during non-development, payment can be made in lieu of tree replacement as part of a permit. Uh, you can also have contribution, contributions from payment of restoration fees for enforcement actions, think penalties, and those are for private trees, um, and also voluntary contributions, of which we've yet to receive any, but there's, there's always one day. So just again, this fund is mostly funded by mitigation fees that happen during development. So in fiscal year 1920, revenue was $906,497. And Title 11 then outlines how we can spend that. And there are a couple of different um, ways that can be spent. Planting trees on public or pri private property, and it can include up to five years of establishment care and any labor or materials needed there. Purchasing conservation easements or acquiring land to retain trees. And all of our work uh, is on planting trees. And so in fiscal year 1920, um, expenditures were $316,825. And I'll cover, um, I'll talk a little bit about the trees that we did plant, but I just want to remind you that um, all of our tree planting work is guided by our urban forest management plan, as well as our tree planting strategy, growing a more equitable forest. And we generally focus on planting trees where the need is highest, and that has been low income and low canopy neighborhoods. And we focus on planting large native and evergreen trees. We really find our best investment is in those high functioning, high providing, long lived trees. So on page six, you can see the totals by program. And we planted um, 5,386 trees during that reporting period. And again, this isn't all that urban forestry planted, but that, that's what we planted using this fund. So trees paid for by, by this fund. Um, so I will um, give you a couple of highlights. So our, our learning landscapes program, and I'm excited to see that several of you have are, are familiar, you guys are so familiar with many of our programs. You've all been out there digging holes and helping with us. But in case you don't know, um, Learning Landscapes, um, we partner with schools and community organizations to plant, tre plant trees, primarily at schools, but also in some public spaces. We work with students and teachers and principals to locate the trees and to get students involved on the planting day. There's often a classroom component. Um, the kids come out and we plant together. They name their tree. They sing a happy birthday. Um, they, they really get involved. And last year, um, we were able to do some um, community plantings, but COVID cut the season short. It all happened right about at the same time. So we did finish the season up with contractors and we were able to plant a total of 94 trees with learning landscapes. The largest component uh, numbers wise is the work that we did in parks, property and natural areas. Um, almost uh, four and a half thousand trees, um, all natives, uh, were planted as part of a larger natural area restoration. Um, we do that work in partnership with a lot of other parks friends groups. There's a long list of sites, um, but we work with our land stewardship team um, and their partners uh, to fund and plant those trees. In developed parks, we planted 48 new trees, and those are at sites that um, are developed and we're planting not to, uh, we're planting in new locations to increase canopy and really enhance recreation or however the site is currently used. And then lastly, um, our yard tree giveaway, we planted 760 trees or gave away 760 trees. The property owners do that planting for us. Uh, we had events in East and North Portland um, during that time period. And if you're not familiar, folks can come and get up to two trees. You also receive mulch, a watering bucket and instructions on how to plant your tree. And we offer about 15 different species, again, with a focus on large native and evergreen trees. So a second piece of this report is to let you know what we have planned for the future, recommendations for future expenditures. And so again, we're drawing on our guidance in the management plan, as well as our citywide planting strategy. 
And the fund is only, you know, it was only started in 2015. So we've really been waiting to see how the balance is going to stabilize before we commit, um, commit funds so that we know, know where we can go and what a sustainable level of expenditure is. So we've, we're starting to hit our stride. Um, and the plans, so this reporting period finished, finished in June of 2020. Um, since then, we have been ramping up two of our programs. Um, one is yard tree giveaway. So we, we reported 760 trees in this time period. This past season, we planted or gave away uh, 1,220 and plans for the coming year are going to be 1,600. And we're aiming to finish at around 2,000. We think that's a market level that we can sustain and also what we can sustain budget wise. Um, we've also initiated a right-of-way planting program, which Mari is managing, and we ran a pilot this year and planted um, 250 trees with contractors in the right-of-way, and that's going great. I think we're getting really good feedback. Um, that's what we call our opt-out program, um, which is a bit different than um, the usual knock and sign up at the door. Um, this is a bit flipped where we're we're telling property owners that they have space, um, providing notices and opportunities, multiple opportunities for them to say um, that if they're interested or if they're not interested. And then we're planting and maintaining the tree for three years. Um, so we're wrapping up our evaluation of that, but we plan to increase that to about 700 trees um, next year. And we think a sustainable balance in the short term is around 1,200 for um, contractor planted trees. So, so that's the, the direction we're going um, with future expenditures. All right, so I'll give you a brief overview now of the Urban Forestry Fund, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, the Urban Forestry Fund is a little bit different. It's the smaller of the two. And the purpose of this fund is to enhance the urban forest through planting of public trees to increase public awareness of trees, tree care, and values of the urban forest. And the revenue comes from a, a smaller pool. So it's coming from essentially um, penalties from actions on city or street trees. So it, it's a much smaller um, group. And the revenue in 1920 was $87,361. And Title 11 allows for a broader use of these funds. It can be to replace um, trees that were illegally removed or damaged on city property, um, to plant public trees, um, to provide education, outreach, and technical assistance, and then other related actions as directed by the city forester. So it's a bit more broad. And in that report period, uh, expenses were $59,598. And the, the expenditure was for park tree inventory. In 2019, we finished up the initial data collection for park tree inventory. Um, and as that wrapped, our volunteers um, assisted with inventorying over 25,000 park trees. And to date, that program has given over um, 22,000 hours from 1,800 volunteers to that community science project. So great success for us, a very big program um, that we were excited to wrap. And now it comes full circle. You know, we have this full um, data set for our park trees, and now we're working with some funding from our upcoming parks levy to do additional tree planting in parks. And so it's great for me to see the, the results of our our work on inventory get put in into action as we go and plant more in our parks. Um, so recommendations for future expenditures from this fund. Um, initially, we were planning to expand youth conservation crew. Um, we will do that this year, but we actually have an additional um, parks levy is going to assist with paying for that as well. So we may not draw down on this fund as much. Um, but we will double, double our crew size. Uh, we'll have 10 youth and two um, youth leaders out working on maintenance and other activities to support recent plantings and other trees. And then with COVID, um, it's been a challenging year budget-wise. And so there have been significant general fund reductions from bureaus. And we are planning to use um, this fund to help support some of our ongoing maintenance and activity work. 
in order to prevent layoffs this year. So that is the summary of the two funds. And I think at that point, I will stop talking and open it up to questions. Thanks so much, Angie, and congratulations. This is really an extraordinary insight into and accomplishment into all the things that you've been busy doing, no doubt. I'm amazed by the number of trees and the expansive nature and the involvement of the communities in doing it. And of course, amidst a pandemic. So amazing. Um, wanna open it up. Yeah, I wanna open it up to commissioners. Questions, responses, thoughts, reactions. Barbara, you're muted. Uh, still muted, Barbara. Sorry. <laughs> Mute. Got there it. Go. Am I un am I unmuted? Yeah, you need voice activation. Unmute. Unmute now. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, uh, it depends on what little button I push whether it works. Um, so Angie, I was wondering uh, when when you do the opt out program, um, how are people receiving? Um, the idea that they're going to have trees because I know that uh, in some places there have been some pushback because they feel like they can't afford to maintain them in the long term. So I'm just wondering, um, since Portlanders love green, I'm wondering if um, how people are receiving um, the idea of getting trees. Great question. And it's been a good response. So I guess I should give a little bit of background. Um, the goal for opt out for us is to be very transparent and to be very clear that um, receiving a tree does mean that you will be responsible for maintenance in the long term. When we did our planting strategy, that was identified as a really important thing to do. So we have, I think we've really um, done a good job at being transparent and giving people many, many opportunities to say no. So it reduces the barrier for planting you know, you don't have to pay for the initial cost of the tree or three years of watering and maintenance, but we want people to understand that you are going to be responsible after that. Um, so we have had, I, I, we're still working on crunching the numbers, but I would say of, of all the folks offered trees, probably about 60 plus percent may say no. So even if one third of folks do say no, we know that they want those trees. Um, that they understand the responsibilities that come with them. And people, um, we've had a lot, of, a lot of good feedback from the community, um, from folks that are excited. We've had some folks who have seen, uh, like they've seen the trees planted and then they've changed their minds and said, oh, they actually look really good. Can I have one too? Um, so we've had some folks add back in. Um, but our, our goal was to Regardless of if people say yes or no, we want them to walk away from the program knowing that they had a choice and knowing that they have a positive interaction with parks and recreation. Um, so that's been our goal. Sorry, it's a longer answer, but I'd say about a third, at least a third are saying yes, and those have been positive responses. Okay. I, I, I guess I wonder if there's a way to get that third up. That's not a, a question. It's just a comment for you know, long term is I wonder if we can, you know, get, you know, up be, beyond a third, because in some of those low canopy, low income, highly diverse neighborhoods, um, they may not, you know, want a tree, but, uh, you know, once the trees get established, um, you know, they like them. So anyway, just a, just a comment, a uh, stray comment. Yeah, Barbara, I think if we um, get the city to pay for public maintenance of public trees, we're going to get a lot more yeses. And that we just have to be honest that this is a financial barrier. And, you know, we're asking we're asking the public to pay for a, a really potentially expensive one day um, public asset. And so, um, you know, I, when I think about the role that the commission plays and discussion about street tree maintenance, I think getting, getting a, a stable funding source for the city to pay for right-of-way tree maintenance is gonna be a game changer. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Bruce. Bruce. 
uh, Angie with uh, Marie's hire uh, and her past experience in Indianapolis. I wonder if it would make sense to pivot to using, um, assume it when COVID restrictions are lifted, of going to volunteer planting as opposed to contractor planting. The expense I believe with contractor planting is much higher. It seems like it would be a more judicious use of scarce resources if there was more of, uh, I think with volunteers, you'll get some of the people who live there engaged in the planting also. Well, there's, there are great benefits to volunteer planting and we do have a really robust uh, volunteer program through Friends of Trees right now. And when we, you know, initially went down this route, you know, we're really not trying to, to duplicate effort and to, to, you know, do something that we're already working on. Um, the challenge with that, Bruce, is that the cost per tree may, might look like it would go down um, because the labor cost is low, but it would increase the amount of staff required. And so we're kind of playing this fine balancing game of of staff costs versus material and contractor cost. And, and the way we've um, thought about opt out is that we really want to be able to provide and pay for watering and establishment, which is really the bulk of the contractor cost, um, because we want to ensure that those trees um, get established and live. Um, so it's a roundabout answer. I do think there is a, a really important role for volunteers to play in maintaining and steward, stewarding the urban forest. And, and we do that through learning landscapes, through some of our community plantings, um, but for now, um, the work that we're doing in the right of way, uh, we are focusing on the contractors and our operations crew. But good, good thoughts, good ideas. Yeah, um, I wanna go Megan and then Daniel. I'm gonna defer to Daniel first as he was actually first. Oh, okay, sorry, I missed that, got it, thanks. Um, well, thank you, Megan. Um, yeah, before I get to my comment, I want to just mention something to Bruce, having been involved for many years now with doing volunteer tree planting events in Portland. Um, volunteers are not as efficient time-wise in terms of planting trees. So that's another kind of trade-off. Um, but I would love to, to talk with Jen or whoever offline about um, some things that I've learned um, working with a different part of parks in planting trees about how to decrease staff costs from the city in giving organizations such as Friends of Trees or Watershed Council uh, more leeway. Because uh, part of the problem is, at least our work with uh, the City Nature East group, is that they have this requirement that um, a staff member be present at all volunteer plantings. And if there was a way to get around that with organizations that you are comfortable that know what they're doing, you could really save a lot of time in doing these planning events, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, my comment had to do with, um, I guess, first of all, Angie, this is great that the numbers of trees getting in the ground is, is really increasing. This is really exciting to see, especially, I see also you're starting to fill a lot of these little holes I talked about earlier with uh, different new places to get trees in the ground. Um, Having worked with the other part of Parks and Rec for many years, um, getting trees planted with volunteers in parks, I'm just wondering how that's gonna work in the future between these two different areas of, of Parks and Rec, because the model that we've used is the par Parks and Rec have, you know, they pay for the plants and then we bring the volunteers in and we get, get that work going, but just um, sounds like you're gonna have two different parts of Parks and Rec doing work both on the same parks, possibly. I'm just wondering how that coordination is going to work. Are you talking about for the, for natural area planting, Daniel? No, parks, actual parks. I mean, like, for instance, we, we worked for many years at Powell Butte, Tideman Johnson Park, Errol Heights Park, some of these other uh, parks, and um, with and it seems like maybe two different groups within parks are now gonna be planting trees there. So I'm just wondering how that's gonna work, especially okay. as you work with community groups. 
Yeah, I see. So um, as we as we plant more as part of the parks levy, um, all of that is going to be coordinated through my team. So we are going to do the planning, um, the siting, working through master plans, working with horticulturalists and folks on the ground. Um, and generally, um, when trees are planted in parks, not always, but generally, they're done by our operations crew. So we then coordinate with our in-house team to do that work. And so all of that is coming from sort of a central location. Um, I see Jen's hand up. Maybe I've misconstrued the, the, the question a little bit, um, but I feel like we've got a good handle on the coordination and we'll be able um, to manage that expansion. And part of the parks levy is also providing adequate staffing to do that work and establishment um, in operations. And um, yeah, Jen, do you wanna to add to that? I don't know if I, I need to. I always talk okay. too much. But yeah, we, we, Daniel, we coordinate closely with landscapeship yeah. and um, and actually all of the trees that are planted. Some of the parks you mentioned are what we call hybrids. So they're uh, part natural area and part developed park. Um, and we use different types of resources in developed and natural areas. Um, but remember in the trust fund report where you saw the plantings in natural areas, a lot of the tree planting and preservation fund is funding those natural area plantings that you're talking about. And so we're working with land stewardship on those. That, that's what I thought. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. So, so we're, we're providing that funding, but they're actually the ones doing the work. OK. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Megan? Yeah, um, Angie, thank you for the overview. And I have a question kind of around just some of the focus with opt-in that I'm just generally interested. So one is, I know that you kind of gave a very broad view of where the focus area is, but I'm curious curious if there's just um, more like more specifics that you can provide of like neighborhood based or how that's kind of parceled out as to where you're focusing. But then I have a, a supplemental question to that is I'm curious if you're seeing and I don't know if you're collecting demographic information on who is opting in and who's yes. not, because I think that's a kind of an interesting nuance. And I, I know that there's yeah. a lot of layers to that. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I have one follow up just thought after that. Okay. Oh, so not overburdened. Yeah. Yeah, great. So, um, so where we focus this current year, uh, Hazelwood and Mill Park neighborhood, East Portland, um, together about 30,000 residents. It's identified as a low canopy, low income um, community with a lot of BIPOC communities as well. It's also bounded by like 84 and not 84, 205 um, and several very busy streets. So um, a great priority neighborhood for us to be working in. Um, that's where, where we worked this year. Um, we're in the process of selecting neighborhoods for next year and we use those identified priority neighborhoods. Um, specifically, um, we also are working in the largest right-of-way sites, so four foot and greater without high voltage uh, lines, just so that we can plant the largest trees that we can. And each neighborhood we sort of, that's in our priority areas, we look at and try to determine what's the best approach. Is it yard trees? Is it street trees? Which program? Um, and we're, we're working on having a much more tailored approach um, by neighborhood. So your second question about demographics, we generally have, we have demographic information by census blocks, but we are not collecting um, specific information about the property owner um, who lives where, where they're re receiving trees. So um, we, we would love to have that information, but it's felt, um, Felt like we haven't had that relationship yet to be able to ask that so directly um, to, to folks. We're looking at doing some more, um, trying to get more feedback directly from property owners. Um, but in general, I would say too, if I had to categorize, um, a lot of the folks that are receiving trees through opt-out are folks who may be kind of indifferent to the tree planting process, if that makes sense. Um, so if you're really excited and you want trees, you've already signed up through like an opt-in program through Friends of Trees or other. If you really don't want trees and you're adamant about it, you have said forget it. 
Um, and so the folks are kind of like, eh, I could take it or leave it. Um, a lot of those are opt-in. And I think um, getting folks to respond to say surveys about demographics or others is gonna be challenging to get um, a consistent response. Um, but we have, I think it would be great information to have um, and we should look at it. So it kind of sounds like, and I, I entirely understand that. I think it's very complex. Yeah. But it sounds like there's kind of a myriad approach that you're taking to kind of trying to target different programs to different levels of community engagement. At least I, I yeah. sense that that is what it is. And one comment that's actually more for Daniel, but I will say is I do clearly, I have a background where I do really care about volunteer engagement and I know it's less efficient um, potentially um, or not, you know, I, um, but I do think that community engagement uh, community wide, right? I think that I wouldn't want efficiency yeah. to be the determinant of an approach um, solely as a, a determining factor. Um, sure. One final question that I had is because you've, you've mentioned Friends of Trees and um, Daniel brought up Johnson Creek, like what is, maybe, I don't know, I honestly truly don't know, what is the level of engagement in some of these processes in, in terms of contractors? I'm assuming that some of those contractors could be nonprofits. So I was just curious what is happening around engaging some of the existing nonprofits in terms of supporting in this work effort. Yeah, so we have three contractors currently, um, two for-profit companies and one nonprofit, Friends of Trees. Um, so we've engaged all three to plant this year. All right. Thanks, Angie. I saw Greg's hand. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to back off a little bit um, because I want to ask about a component of how these funds can be used that we have not uh, used before. And I, I want to do it reminding people of the the land use changes, which when COVID is mitigated somewhat, I think development will spring back in a big way. So we had the residential infill and then we had the, um, you know, build up to four to six units on things that prior had been single family homes. And that is, and the committee or the commission has touched on it a couple times, but I'm still, really intrigued by the idea of conservation easements. And I realize that this is a place where money could go out really fast, but in a way I'm, I'm seeing if I'm interpreting it correctly, say three times as much money, even in the COVID, you know, part of a year coming in as is spent. And so to me with, you know, $4 million sitting there, I think it would be worthwhile given the, the GIS talents in the Bureau and the arborists on staff to really look for some of those vulnerable parcels where basically, you know, significant trees in these low income, low canopy neighborhoods um, are really gonna be vulnerable in that, uh, you know, there's a right to remove so many trees. Uh, it's obviously usually cheaper to just, that's why this fund is so, uh, well-funded at the moment to just buy the death of these trees. Um, and it takes so many years to build these trees. I, I really like to see if there's any way to explore the use of the conservation easements or land purchase, um, particularly in the neighborhoods that are on low canopy. So if it's got some canopy and it's likely to become apartments or, you know, fourplexes, could we actually explore using, say, a million dollars to preserve trees? So, I, two things. One, um, the balance doesn't, it may look large, but I think you need to remember that um, establishment cost goes into future years. So, what, what you see as the balance doesn't mean that it's available. It's already committed for watering and establishment for trees up to three years, five years down the road. Um, so as we plan our sustainable level of expenditure, I think it's around 600,000 a year is about the max that we can spend 
um, to maintain a balance. And Brian, Brian's our financial analyst. He can tell me if I'm right or not, but that's what we're aiming for. So committing a million um, would, would bankrupt that really fast. Um, but Greg, I appreciate the thought. I, we've really opted to just focus on planting right now and to focus on that equitable distribution. Um, there may be a place in the future, but the cost to, for the benefit has just been too big at this point, and the fund hasn't been large enough uh, to support. You know, six hundred thousand won't buy you a lot, um, or it won't buy it won't buy much citywide. Um, and Jen can probably Jen and Brian can talk more on the finance end uh, of that. I see your hands up. Yeah, thanks, Angie. I do see Brian's hand up, and then Jen. Yeah, I just want to chime in. Angie, you said exactly what I was going to say is um, as we're planting trees, we're also, um, you know, taking on the future cost li li liability of watering those. So that's something you're not seeing in those in those fund, fund reports is, um, you know, over the next four years, hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of what, what watering costs. And um, Angie's right, we're looking at, um, you know, increasing the, the contractor side planting to about 600 to $800,000 a year over the next few years. But um, what that essentially puts us, because one thing we should note is with COVID, the, we were expecting a two or three, potentially four year lull in development activity in the city. And in a lot of ways, that's great because that means fewer trees removed, which is our, our ultimate goal is to pre preserve trees. Um, but we're looking at the revenue going to the fund being being about half next year, so that's a dramatic drop in in in, in the, the revenue that we're seeing, and so that obviously affects our, our our plans. And so, as Angie mentioned, we are planning on increasing to about 1,200 contract trees a year. Um, after about four or five years of that, though, the fund balance with revenue being down could be about half. It could be down to about two million. So, like. We are essentially looking every few years to rethink how much we can spend out of it because the revenue is going to change every year. So that's that's part of the factors that go into it, and 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 why you're seeing about a four four, four million dollar balance right now. Um, Jen, you want to further clarify, and then I see yeah. Greg and Bruce. Thanks, Vivek. Mine's a little different, and um, Greg, I know that you've brought up easements before, and easements are a great vehicle in my experience for protecting natural resources, including trees. And in past lives, I've, I've worked on easement programs as a government entity, but also from the nonprofit background and on some boards I've been on. And one thing to remember about easements is it's a whole program that would need to be developed and staffed. And a lot of that work on easements comes in after the first property owner who signed on is no longer in the picture and it becomes a lot of legal uh, and program structure that needs to be in place to do that. That said, I personally think that that would be a, a wonderful role for some other entity in, this, in the city of Portland to take over, not necessarily a city entity, but if there were another organization that was interested in, in getting and holding easements to protect trees, uh, boy, that would be fantastic, like a, a nonprofit or something like that. Um, Greg, you want to follow up and then I see Bruce? Yeah, I, I would like to see um, kind of in a way what Brian says about the money, that's that's great. I think we should really know how much of the, based on each year, what the projected, it's sort of like showing that money's still there is a little bit deceptive. It, it, not in any deliberate way, but knowing how much of it actually is promised would be helpful. So there's 4 million there, but actually because of this year, you know, one more year of maintenance of the first year's planting and two years and then three years for each success, but you're just knowing what's actually um, still going to be available would be really helpful. Yeah, we could show what is actually um, uh, encumbered as, as a future cost, which we have committed to. Um, a lot of the plan spending is just that it's planned and we do have, we do have con contracts, but um, we won't know until we actually get to the planting season how much we'll actually spend. But um, we could show in these reports in future years um, what future funding is actually, or future expenses are actually, actually uh, committed to right now. That'd be great, thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Greg. Bruce. Um, 
with a new uh, group of city commissioners that we have uh, and their different interests, I think it would be very useful in this annual report that goes to them that you somehow information is in there that the funds are going to uh, tree planting in low canopy areas and low income neighborhoods. I think that needs to jump out a lot more. I keep thinking about Joanne Hardesty's constant uh, questioning of what did this agency do or that agency do to open up the application pool to a diversity of applicants. And she keeps asking and she keeps getting responses that maybe she's not real happy with. So um, I reread the report this morning and yes, you are mentioning schools that I think are all in low canopy neighborhoods. The natural planting areas are not na necessarily in low canopy areas, but I think you can do a better job of bringing that out to the city commissioners so you don't have any questions that you know they don't need to spend their time because it's oh yeah they're taking care of it because parks is saying repeatedly we're serving the uh the community that we haven't served very well in the past and i think you have to be more assertive in documenting that and showing that and selling people on that so i would encourage you the format of this year's annual report is exactly the same as last year. We have different commissioners. I think you have to use a little different approach there. That's one comment. The other thing, um, when I look back at uh, the figures for the Urban Forestry Fund and the Tree Planting and Preservation Fund over the last five years, last year when I had reservations about the lack of spending of revenues collected, I said, well, it related to what we collected the previous year. We spend based on what we collected the previous year. Um, so now this year we're being told, no, it, it relates to really what we're projecting for the funding for the next three or four years. So I, I would like, I appreciate Brian's willingness to talk about funds that have been I forget the term you use, but we're gonna spend them in the next couple of years. Because to me, it looks like this is just a slush fund that keeps collecting and getting bigger and bigger and bigger each year. And it's being saved for, I don't know what. The explanation that Brian gave was helpful, but um, I, and who knows what the economy will do and the funds coming in. I realize that's difficult, but in the meantime, there's a lot of trees that are coming down and they're not being planted today. They may be planted 10 years from now. They may never be planted because you have uh, concrete there. I don't know, but it's, um, we have urban heat island now. The benefits of trees planted today, we're not gonna realize for many years. So I, there is urgency and I understand there's, um, fiscal responsibility, I appreciate that. But at the same time, I don't think it's fiscally responsible if you're holding on to the funds a needlessly long time. Thanks, Bruce. Um, any response to that at all, Brian or Jen or Angie? I think, I think I'll just note that um, the nature of a rolling fund um, it, it, it can be a bit deceptive in that you're seeing an existing fund balance versus um, a, a planting program that gets a dedicated amount of general fund or ratepayer funding. Then you're just seeing that 1.3, 1.5 million. You're not seeing the, the future re revenue sources built into that. With, with, a, with a permanent fund like the tree planting and preservation fund, you are you are see, seeing that, and so um, by seeing that, by having that existing fund balance, it does put a fiduciary obligation on us to spend it prudently and at the amount that we can afford to. So this is a permanent source of funding that can su su sustain a program. So yes, we 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 use a five year cash flow pr projection, 
which means we're looking at prior years, yes, but we're also informed on what are we looking ahead at and um, an impact like COVID is something that we you do try to plan plan for when the revenue drops by half. So um, as Angie mentioned, the total tree planting is gonna be at about 3000 trees a year in um, about two planting seasons. That's the, that's the road, road that we're on right now. So um, you are gonna see expenses increase, um, but we're definitely not gonna um, over, over commit the amount of spending that we, 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 we can do, which could put the actual su sustainability of the program um, in a pretty, pretty bad, bad uh, spot. And, and thanks, Bruce, for the feedback on the first item. I think I can certainly incorporate an element of reporting back on um, what is planted in those priority neighborhoods because we track that. So we'll make sure to include that. And I just want to assure folks on the record that neither of these funds are used as slush funds in any way. And we report to you and in writing to council each year on how they're used. Yeah. Um, and they are very carefully used. And we take our responsibility for using the public's resources quite seriously. I'm, I want to be aware of time. I just had a very quick, quick question that's actually entirely unrelated. Um, was I missed last meeting because I didn't have power because there was a historic ice storm. And I was just, so if you all talked about this, I apologize and it could be a future conversation, but I'm kind of curious if there's any interesting intersectionality right now, because unfortunately we lost a lot of trees or had major failure. And I just didn't know if we, I mean, we probably don't have data, but we have some data of coming in. If there's just any data intersectionality also around helping support with planting efforts right through some of these efforts with where some maybe there was some tree loss. I didn't just didn't know what's possible because it's it's devastating. So um. I don't know if that's code, right? I mean, it could be because it's opened up. I remember going to council and talking about this opening up this for not just the specific areas from which the trees have come down, development or otherwise, right? Brian, Jen? Yes, Tip, that would be for me, Vinak. To, to be brief, um, trees that were removed, regardless, that are regulated, regardless of the source of the removal, uh, there's required mitigation or replacement or combination thereof for all of those. And a lot of the damage was on parks, properties, and streets. Parks, properties, we replace things that are removed for whatever reason. And on street trees, I'm going to bring us back to the earlier conversation. We would not have seen anywhere near the extent of damage that we saw from the ice storm if trees were proactively maintained in streets. But meantime, it is the adjacent property owner's responsibility and our tree inspectors are dealing with a whole lot of those things right now. That good question. Thanks, Megan. Um, I think uh, we got to wrap this up. Daniel, one final comment? Sure. Just uh an idea. I remember a few years ago when we were devoting a lot of time to the street tree maintenance, um, trying to find solutions and funding in that. <clears throat> One of the things that came up was, wouldn't it be cool if we tried to pilot in like either one neighborhood in the city or part of a neighborhood? Um, and I'm wondering if it would be an allowable use of some of these trust funds to maybe pick a small area in the city and offer, let's say, the first five years of maintenance cost for, you know, people in low income neighborhoods <clears throat> that the city parks, you know, with this funding would take on the watering and the, the, the pruning, whatever, for the first few years. Just, and, and then that way you could get an idea of what the actual costs were later and it would help inform some future ideas for when we do get around to talking about this issue again. So just an idea. All right. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Angie, so much for spending the time. No, we went a little bit over. Really appreciate you hanging in there and fielding some of these questions and comments. A lot Thank needless, you. Yeah, needless to say, we've got a lot, a lot of interest in this. Um, let's transition. Um, Really appreciate the engagement here. Transition into 
our conversation about bylaws. We have about half hour here for bylaws, and I think that'll be sufficient because really we're we have a few things that are going on with bylaws. Um, there, as you might remember, just to give you context, um, Civic Life came in and kind of standardized bylaws across the city. And um, Brian had sent out a um, set of bylaws, which there was some, um, um, which is what we're really building this conversation around. And it kind of breaks out, I wanna pull them up here, have them up. Um, Give me one second. Um, yeah, so uh, they're, they, they're broken up by number of number of people, the city's role, frequency of meetings, etc. cetera. And um, there are a few things that have come up here that I think is worth noting, but I, um, I wanna just, I wanna make sure we have time to talk about the subcommittees and the specific um, makeup of the subcommittees, the roles, responsibilities of subcommittee members, the composition of subcommittee members. So that's uh, section seven um, on page four of six in the bylaws. I, I know I wanna save time for that, but I, maybe I just start with some general comments about the bylaws and then we can get into specific sections that I think Brian, you might be seeking some feedback as well. Is there another section or, or um, that we might wanna focus in on as well, Brian? That's actually it, Vivek. You nailed it. That's where we've we've really this. I think this is the third or fourth time um, we've been able to have a conversation on the updated bylaws, and um, I believe we've reached pretty solid consensus on every item except the one that you just talked about um, on the sub, sub subcommittee. So um, we wanted to have dedicated time today to really zero in on that one and uh, reach a um, as close to a consensus as we can get, so we can um, vote on these. Okay, yeah, so we are looking for a vote on this. So um, really let's get right into it. Unless there's a really pressing general question about other sections of the bylaws that any commissioners wanna bring up, I'd like to uh, get into section seven. Um, and if you might need a minute to pull those up, but um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started on this. Barbara, muting. Great. Oh, solid. First shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, next time we have a call, it'll be different. Um, <laughs> it always seems to be a different button. Um, so I, I can't find the uh, copy that um, we were looking at a copy, and I don't have it in front of me. The reason I'm saying that is because I just wanted to make sure I, I sent a note out after they were sent out, um, which I can't find in my inbox. Um, or my file um, is that the appeals board is you know has separate. Uh, I see Brian nodding his head. Yeah, these, these bylaws would not affect the um, the appeals board. The appeals board is sort of its own section of code, actually, and it's um, they have their own rules that would not would not uh, be um, affected here. I remember those rules. I wrote them. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Just, just wanted to make sure. Thank you very much. All right, so anything else more generally or should we, can we jump into section seven here? It's, a, it's an email dated March 12th, uh, by the way, from Brian that has the bylaws this year. Oh, thank you. Um, um, so I, I mean, if there's not, I want to kind of maybe even put into the chat a very specific section of this. So it starts off with chairperson, vice chairperson, and then gets down to um, kind of the bureau staff liaison. But then it gets into um, the subcommittee meetings are also subject to these bylaws in Oregon public meeting law and must abide by quorum requirements when voting. And here's this, here are the two sentences that I'm, I'm kind of honing in on here. Um, while subcommittees may engage non-members, only members may vote to approve reports and recommendations to be forwarded to the full UFC, right? So that's one sentence, just think about that one. And then the second is when voting the quorum for subcommittee members is simple majority of the subcommittee. So that's again, just the 50% um, plus one or greater number of seats. Um, so the, um, 
there is one other piece in this. I don't see this explicitly, Brian. Maybe you could, uh, it's the membership per se. And we did talk about membership um, being uh, community members versus city staff and that issue. We've raised that issue in the past and the extent to which um, bylaws um, kind of are silent on that, which is I, maybe I'm reading, maybe I'm not reading the right section, but is it true that the bylaws are silent on that? Um, I think we're, are you referring to um, committee membership as opposed to voting members of a correct committee? Yeah. So the bylaws don't really speak to, um, you know, what the, what the role of a committee member would be. It really only speaks to what the role of a, of a, of a voting member of the committee would, would be. And I think the intention here is um, these are public, the Urban Forest Commission is a, is a pu public body and the, um, the meetings are open to anyone who would like to attend and the subcommittees would function in the same way. But when it came to actually voting, um, the question is, right, would it, would, would it only be UFC members on the subcommittees who would vote? Um, which, which again opens up the question of um, if, if, if we were to allow for um, any person at the committee to, to vote, um, that, would, that would also need some sort of system and structure to determine who is actually on the committee and who is, who is not. The way that the bylaws are envisioned right now, that isn't really a necessary conversation because it would simply be whoever the UFC mem mem member serving on that sub subcommittee. I hope that makes sense. I know it's a <laughs> little. Right. I see Daniel. We want to go around on this one. Let's kind of do a round robin, maybe. Daniel, you want to start us off, and I'll just check in if you don't have any input, and start with Daniel, and then Greg, and then just kind of goes go around. Yeah, Brian, I had a, a question um, on that same issue. Um, is it for voting? Is it the commission members who actually are at the subcommittee meeting at the time the vote is taken? Is it you know, if we have an official roster of which committee members are on that subcommittee, um, because I don't know about the other subcommittees, but like the policy committee, we have two commissioners. Mm -hmm. So if one of them is absent, we couldn't possibly take any kind of vote because 50% right. right. plus one means both of us. So just kind of wondering that clarification. Yeah, I think that's something that the UFC, I think that would be up to the, the UFC's discretion is would, would they want it to be a set um, mem membership for the subcommittee or um, would, would it be a more of like a rolling rolling roster of whoever is able to attend and uh, participate and I, I think that's something that would be decided part of the purpose of these bylaws is that the UFC would actually vote to establish um, which subcommittees it wants to have and for which which purpose and so I think it could be um, at, I think at the time that the UFC takes that vote, they could actually say, here's who's gonna serve on it, or um, it could just be whoever is able to um, 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 attend. Yeah, that's an internal thing with UFC, I think. And right now, just so you, I, I think we have um, heritage tree and policy right now. We, um, uh, outside of the appeals, we have those two subcommittees. And again, we are, it, it, we have some autonomy as to what subcommittees we think are important and necessary. And that's really has a lot to do with interest and involvement. So if there's a subcommittee that wants to think about uh, strategy and stuff like that, that that's like open, right? That's open to the conversation. So we can, we can put that up on an agenda item if it's helpful to you all. But right now, those two are kind of the standing subcommittees that we're talking about. Barbara. Um, oh, actually, sorry. I had, yeah, I had Greg going next and we were gonna do a round robin here, but Barbara, maybe you can go next and then Greg, are you okay with that? Okay, Barbara. Um, just just um, uh, in the voice from the past department, um, we have had, we had a subcommittee for a while on um, to try and recruit some new members to the um, Urban Forestry Commission and um, 
we also had a subcommittee for the Jade District. Uh, you might, that was a more recent one. And then we had another subcommittee that was working on, I, don't know, I think it was some input, but I, I guess one thing I would say is that um, since we're advisory to the uh, program and to the city commissioner and um, you know Jen's staff and all that, isn't the subcommittee advisory to the, com and we, we have a, an appointment to do that. So the subcommittee, it seems like, should be advisory to the commission, in which case it seems like you could develop. So it seems to me that uh, uh, subcommittees can come and go and they, you know, they have in the past as needed. And then, but we actually had, you know, in black and white printed, um, you know, who were the, the members of the subcommittee. And I would think that, you know, members of the subcommittee and, you know, the, there were things like you were supposed to be at so many meetings and each subcommittee had uh, their own little set of by, bylaws or rules or whatever. And I think they were called bylaws, but they could be called anything. And, um, you know, so that, uh, and then if you had, if you missed so many meetings in a row, you know, you were out or, you know, some, you know, they had various different things. But I would think that if you had a printed roster and you said these people are on the subcommittee, that they could, not including city staff, they could vote. And I would think the reason that you wouldn't want anybody to show up at the meeting and vote is because you could stack an issue that way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we all care about this, that, or whatever. And let's all go to, you know, they're having a, a public meeting. Let's all go because we can all vote. And I've got a car and, it, you know, it's got, I can fit, you know, eight people. What I mean, I'm making this up, obviously, but I think you see my point. So Barbara, may I, can I just clarify, um, by this language, a non-member, I, I read it as a non-UFC member, or are you, are you referring to this as anybody and everybody who's not part of a subcommittee or because that, right? Because then you can get anyone to come up and vote, but this is saying that while subcommittee, uh, while subcommittees may engage non-members, only members may vote to approve reports and recommendations to be forwarded uh, to the full UFC. I, I was reading that as members of the subcommittee because I think uh, we've already just discussed the issue with, so, so the subcommittee is advisory to the commission. You right. know, the commission, I mean, even to, uh, you know, the appeals board chair and the people on the appeals board and all of the uh, rules of procedure, which is all laid out in code, the commission has to vote on all that. You know, that's not something that, can just be done. So it seems to me that if a subcommittee who works on an issue and you've got people like Roberta Jortner and people like that, that they can, the people who are officially on that committee, uh, urban forestry commissioners and non right. could vote. And, you know, and that's how we used to do it was it was in black and white who was on the committee and who wasn't on the committee. Because if you get into the situation of only, uh, you know, the, the commission members voting, I think you possibly run into a quorum issue. Yeah, yeah, right. It's not an action of the, of the commission itself. It's an action of, you know, one or two uh, people. And, you know, I mean, I think the commission is the one that then, you know, a subcommittee puts together, you know, with their commission members and non-commission members that have been working on something, they bring something to the commission and the commission, they present it and the commission then votes on it. So I was reading it okay. as members of yeah. the subcommittee. That makes sense. I see, you. Yeah. I, I see Megan's hand raised, but I, I, I wanna make a quick, just cause Barbara brings up two quick issues and I wanna clarify, cause I think those are important. Um, yes, in, in the bylaws, member is always a member of the UFC. The bylaws do not currently, um, envision or re recognize non uc members serving on the on the on, on the committee so that's that that's why you're seeing that language in there the second one is barbara you're absolutely right um and tony i think um, touched on this and maybe one of our last conversations in the bylaws um if the if the sub if the ufc has 
delegated its official authority to a subcommittee, then um, it then it, it has to be a UFC member that actually is voting on it um, because the, the, the authority is staying with the UFC. Um, it's really because we're envisioning these committees as being advisory to the Fuller co co Commission um, that um, we're having this conversation because the UFC then does have some discretion in terms of um, who is serving on these sort of in these sort of advisory capacities since the UFC would still hold its, its own vote on the issue. So the UFC is still holding on to its, its, um, its act, actual role. So you're, you're ex exactly right. The reason the UFC has some discretion here in terms of who would be voting members of the committee is because that subcommittee is not making an actual choice. They're making a, re 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 a recommendation. Right. Yeah, I, I just think that gets sticky when you get into the subcommittee is going to vote on, on something because then people, you know, I think people can misunderstand that. And I think they can mis misappropriate it. Yeah, can we go to Greg? Um, I know Greg has been, um, also has a spreadsheet to potentially share um, with the group. And then Megan, we can come back to you right after this. Thank you. Brian, would you mind sharing that spreadsheet that Greg has requested? I think. Yep, sure thing, let me pull that up. Yeah, your comments are directed to the spreadsheet, right, Greg? Yeah, yeah, I'm currently chair of the Heritage Street Committee. And basically, Every decision that we make is a recommendation for the Urban Forestry Commission to consider and vote on, but we essentially do your legwork. And I know in the presentations that I give each year, I've started showing you the membership of the committee, kind of a picture of us at one of our, our tree tours. But this language as it's uh, currently designated is a real problem because I am currently an urban forestry commissioner. So is Damon. And Brian was, but he uh, retired early. Damon and I both have terms that end next February. Um, and I think we're both interested in still serving, but you could, <laughs> depending on who your new commissioners are and your existing commissioners, uh, need to like put at least one of them on this committee to even have it really report to you. So this chart shows you that we have two city staff. Uh, Gina is our liaison. Frank is our inspector. Some of the time Dan Gleason fills in for him. And I wanna point out that this is actually a pretty technically astute committee. And uh, we've got a lot of arborists. We have some very high level sort of master, you know, certified master arborists, tree risk assessors. And with the heritage trees, that's expertise that's not on the Urban Forestry Commission for the most part. Um, so my feeling is that I, I'd like us to see us, if, if you have to review this membership, change this membership, um, I'd like to see, and you, it, Brian, if you can go down a little bit, I showed you uh, some options I just sort of hastily thought of. And um, the first one would be to actually change the bylaws. And I know from bringing it up in the two previous discussions that uh, there's some resistance to this from, you know, Tony and the legal point of view. Um, we could also just operate where we would vote and then have whoever is an urban forestry commissioner vote to confirm what the whole committee has selected. Or frankly, we'd have to recruit from the commission and add to your um, current uh, responsibilities so that you would spend two or three full days touring the nominated trees and attending uh, you know, four to six two hour meetings that we do throughout the rest of the year. These committee members also do a fair amount of tree sleuthing on their own or in partners, although we had to cut that back this last year. So frankly, I think this is a, a matter to me of respect for the expertise of these people. And you can go back up um, and just their service. I, I, I don't think that my vote should really matter more than theirs does. And ultimately we don't do anything other than 
say we think this tree uh, should be delisted or we think these trees uh, are worthy of being forwarded to council and here each of them is and would you please make a decision so ultimately we're doing the legwork for the urban forestry commission the full commission is making uh, the decisions and I'll, I'll let it go back to uh, everybody else okay thanks greg um any response to this quickly before going to Megan? Megan, maybe you have a response to this as well. I think what my comments are, I think very much align with both what Barbara and um, Greg shared. And I think one thing I often hear Jen talk about is how we are volunteers, um, right? And just recognizing what we're both committed to as a collective, but also our capacity. And so I think that um, I feel that if we can be drawing upon more people to support this work, I think there's a benefit very much as Greg has outlined. And one thing I do think about that kind of came up in, in Barbara in your example that like a group of people come and we're there voting, like honestly, one thing I would think of is we're all still us and we're Daniel and Bruce overwhelmed by a group of people rabid with an idea they would still come and speak their truth in their advisory capacity. I'm not worried that Daniel wouldn't be able to use discretion or Bruce to say, right. there was a lot of people that joined and we actually would not recommend what the voting recommendation was. So I think that just having a nuance to that reality feels a bit important, right? That I still think that the people that are ultimately gonna have the strongest voice on this commission are commissioners themselves. So if something is coming from a subcommittee and there's a concern about non-UFC members and things that they brought forward, I, I do think that there's still processes in place due to our structure. Um, that would kind of allow some countering of, of those concerns. So I just want to think about it really realistically about how that looks like. Um, so you don't see much any concern in the language as it's set up right now because the structure already exists, Megan, is that right? Um, I mean, I guess I think I, I find some appeal in some of the commentary that came up about like thinking a bit more comprehensively about who our subcommittees are. I think that there's maybe appeal to that. I more just think that um, I, I, you know, I think the voting element and, and some of that is, uh, I feel like in some ways, and maybe they need to because they're bylaws. I think we're a little in the weeds um, logistically as to how some of this actually plays out. Um, and I, I want us to be successful and not less successful because we got caught up on a technicality. I think that's what I'm trying to get at. Okay, thanks. Jen, see your hand. Thank you, Vivek. Um, the Heritage Tree Program, just to refresh everyone's memory because it's pre-me, so maybe we don't remember this. Um, the Heritage Tree Committee has not always been what it is. Uh, the code requirement is that the Forestry Commission uh, recommends listing and delistings to city council. It doesn't say there has to be a committee or that has to be structured a certain way. And in the past, uh, there have been times when city staff just brought recommendations to the Forestry Commission for the group to vote on as you do now. So I just want to make that known. And then the second of the two things, and this is following up a little bit on what Megan was saying. So we continue as a city and uh, as a forestry commission to have goals around equity, diversity, and inclusion and representing the folks that are served by us, you, and the city's forest um, better, better representation there. So just keep in mind that what the makeup of a committee is has an influence on what the conversations are and the decisions and the recommendations rather than decisions, I guess, to, uh, recommendations that are made to the commission. Um, and, and that's an area we, I think, would all agree continues to need some development. That's all. Thanks, Vivek. All right. Thanks, Jen. Daniel? Um, actually, we were going to go round robin, Daniel. Do you want to, okay. do you mind if we kind of check in with people who haven't said anything like uh Anjanette, Bruce um I think are two there's anything Bruce coming up for you Anjanette coming up for you about the bylaws that you want to bring up 
you can pass as well if nothing. Um, for me, I think that I would like to keep integrity of our processes, but also if someone is doing as much work as uh, Greg had mentioned uh, and doing work for us, that there should be some type of um, trust or, you know, privilege that they have to be able to do certain things. So maybe if there, if our subcommunities are doing work that still has to come back and be approved by us, I don't understand why it matters if they decided within their group to do something because uh, they would still be able to do that. They just won't call it a vote. Like, no matter what, if you're in a group of people, you're going to have to decide together what you're going to work on, what you're not going to work on, and how you're going to handle things. So by us putting these restraints on, we may be causing people to have to find loopholes or figure out ways to get their work done uh, without breaking our our bylaws. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's that, yeah, it's that level of autonomy. I mean, right now, Daniel, I mean, for policy and Greg for Heritage Tree, there is, would you, would you both agree that there's a fair bit of autonomy in terms of your own um, like recruitment process, kind of governance processes within each of these committees, and then your the, the process you use to kind of forward things to the UFC as a whole? Is that, is that a fair statement that you have by and large generally pretty wide autonomy to be able to develop your structures and processes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for Heritage Street Committee, we have bylaws. They're okay. uh, out of date. The committee actually has started to edit them and I need to work with some of the committee members and do an update of them. I, I reported in the past on our recruitment efforts. We had one member um, who was there. It was actually a former forestry commissioner and landscape architect who passed away. And that was an impetus to us to uh, among, there were other reasons as well. We wanted to get geographic diversity and our bylaws really didn't cover how our committee was staffed or who approved it or whatnot. So Gina did a great job and uh, put a lot of effort into trying to increase our diversity, equity, and inclusion. The reality in terms of who applied was that everyone was white. We have a pretty good gender balance now, but it's a technical committee and so I've stressed in the past our need to like get more heritage trees in outer east. And we were able to find two residents who were active and knowledgeable from that area. And we added someone in Southwest. Okay. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's a little hit or miss. Okay, the bylaws are helpful. Bruce, did you wanna just in, um, have a comment? We're closing, coming around the corner at the end here, but I'd love to hear from you. Uh, my only comment is I am apologize for the use of the term slush. Um, that was an injudicious use of that term, and and that's not what I meant. So I'm sorry to Jen and Brian that I said that. My comments, I think, expressed my concerns, but the use of the term was clearly inappropriate. So I apologize. Thanks, Bruce. Clarification. I'm not hearing a great deal of, um, uh, I'm not hearing a great deal of need to revise what the language is right now. I mean, we, I don't wanna necessarily get into wordsmithing per se, but I'm not hearing any sentiment unless I've misheard um, in terms of what the language currently sits for this subcommittee structure. So are we, unless I'm hearing otherwise, are we hearing, can, uh, can we get a vote? Barbara and Greg? Am you're, I me? Yep, you're, we can hear you. Oh, oh, good. Okay. Um, I, I guess I wonder uh, if we should clarify the term member, sub, yeah. subcommittee member, okay. um, because that might that might uh, resolve, yeah. you know, whatever we're you know. Okay, Brian, can we do that? Can we do that? 
Yeah, I think, um, and I, th I think that's maybe a choice we can make right now is um, the in, in the way the by bylaws are written right now, member refers to a, an appointed member of the UFC. Okay. If that and to, and if, that, if that wants if that right, to. but what we were hearing earlier is that the only members may vote. So that would mean yeah. only member. I mean, if we could even put two words between only members of, since it's talking about subcommittees, only members of the subcommittee may vote to approve reports and recommendations that then get pushed to the UFC. Yeah, I think the the wordsmithing is pretty straightforward. Um, I can handle that after after this meeting. Um, I think that's that that's what I'm I'm kind of looking for is what direction is the commission leaning towards? Yeah, Greg, any quick follow up? I I would support the the uh, revision that would be only members of the subcommittee, like official members of the subcommittee or appointed members of the subcommittee may, may vote. But if it remained the language uh, implying that it was only the Urban Forestry Commission members of subcommittees, I would actually vote no for it. And I'd hate to put off having bylaws updated, but um, I, just, I just don't see it viable for either heritage trees or uh, policy. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, can we can we have a motion then with I mean it sounds like there might be we might be ready for a motion since we're a little bit over time here we I want to call potentially ask for a motion for a vote and see where we are unless there's some other issues coming up Jen I'm sorry Vivek I know you're trying to move it along but I think this means that Daniel as far as I know there is no set membership of the policy committee so that would need to happen am I correct on that Yeah, we don't have an official roster. I mean, we have a lot of people that we have on a mailing list, but a lot of them haven't come to a meeting for two or three years. So that's something we could do fairly easily. Yeah. And there'd have to be a selection process of some sort for, for that, which all would need to be developed if you're changing the language in this way. Yeah. Okay, Daniel, we can come back and forth on that. So uh, the request still stands. Um, called for a call for a vote. Anybody? Could do we have? Could a you? Yeah. Could you clarify? Is this just on this particular part of the bylaws, or a vote on the entire bylaws? Because we haven't really talked about any of the other issues other than committee membership. Yeah. yeah I, this was, I, go ahead, Brian. Sorry, sorry to be back. Thanks. Um, I, I think for right now, especially since we're, we only have six members right now, um, I, I do feel like we've covered the other issues in the, in the bylaws. But I think right now, if we could have a vote just on this issue, and then depending on the direction it goes, I can amend the bylaws and come back at a future meeting where we'll actually vote on the actual lang language as it is. Um, it's really this issue that I'd love to have some uh, choice made on. Yeah, so, okay, thanks, Brian, for that clarification and offer to come back because there might be some other things that come up. So um, then we're section seven we're voting on right now um, with the, it sounded like with a minor amendment to the language. Anybody wanna call a vote or at least make a motion for a vote? Anybody? <laughs> okay, I don't know if we're ready to vote on this. Uh, is that the read I'm getting? Okay, sounds like we have some more conversing to do. Um, let's, um, let's hold off on this then, if I'm not getting a call for a vote. Um, sounds like there's a little bit more deliberation. Didn't mean to rush this through but it's the time we have. Maybe Brian, we could make that correction, come back and maybe even vote on the whole thing um, in a future meeting. I think what I'll do is I'll write up a version of, of each and people can review the two language options and then we can return to this hopefully next month. Okay, okay. And Greg's given a suggestion there that we can consider as well in the, in the chat. 
All right. Well, thank you everybody for hanging on a little bit long today. Apologies to go um, too long. Your commitment to this committee, to this uh, commission, is just un, uh, is just really unbelievable. And as Ruth Bader Ginsburg once said, the only threat to our future is apathy. So thanks for not being apathetic about this stuff and really, as Megan said earlier, um, giving a hoot. Um, I hope to see you next time. We're we're uh, moving full into spring in April, so. I will call the meeting to a close for now. Thanks for all your input. Appreciate your uh, time. All right. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Jen. Thank you Thanks, all. Everyone. Take care. Okay. Bye.